Grace and peace to you. Welcome. I'm grateful that you are making Sunday worship a part of the rhythm of your life and your week, whether you're out there online or whether you're here on a beautiful late winter, right, Sunday. It feels like spring, but not yet. I'm reminded that actually the word Lent, part of that word right there, I mean, there's a lot of meaning in Lent, but the word Lent is actually related to the word Lent for the lengthening of days that come in springtime, and we feel it. There's signs of renewal all around us. We have a wonderful Sunday here planned. Um, I want to start with a few announcements about um, what's going on in the life of the church, and then a little bit about worship, and then I'll invite Linda up for an announcement from the mission committee about one great hour of sharing. So you will see as we are in Lent, here in, for those who are here in worship, you'll see the flower order sheet. These are for Easter flowers, for Easter Sunday. Um, for those of you online, sorry we didn't get those out yet, but we will. We'll send them out um, in an email so you can order flowers as well. Um, that order is due at the very latest Palm Sunday, um, which is March 28th. Um, but get them in ahead of time. You can put them in the offering plate, turn them into the church office. For those of you here um, and there for worship, we are set for communion, so make sure that you grab your communion elements. There's some out there on the narthex. If you haven't done that yet, um, or for those of you at home, um, grab what you'd like, and we will do that at the end of worship end of our time here this morning. Well, friends, that is really all I have for announcements uh, here regarding that and worship. I will invite uh, Linda Heimarsh up from the Mission Committee, and she's also a worship leader, so when she's done with her announcement, we'll segue right into our call to worship. Millions of people lack access to sustainable food sources, clean water, sanitation, education, and opportunity. The three programs supported by One Great Hour is sharing, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, the Presbyterian Hunger Program, and self-development of people all work in different ways to serve individuals and communities in need. From initial, initial disaster response to ongoing community development, their work fits together to provide people with safety, sustenance, and hope. When Jesus started his ministry, he first talked to two fishermen. He told them he would make them fishers of men, and they followed. I hold a fish-shaped box, and there's more of them out on the way out of the sanctuary. It's a symbol of those fishermen. And, ask you to pick, and I ask you to pick up one on your way out of church today. You don't have to be a kid to have a fish bank. But you can color it if you wish. <laughs> or you can give it to a child. We may not be fishers of men in the same way, but we can be helpers by putting spare change into the banks to help them, the One Great Hour Sharing Campaign, and bring them back at the end of the month and turn them in with, um, it will be blessed. At this time, all who can stand, please stand for call to worship. Gather us in, the broken and the joyful, Gather the sin, the weak and the strong. Gather the sin, the young and the old. Gather the sin, to praise Jesus Christ and to worship in wonder. Gather the sin, to know of God's love.
called a confession. God calls us from our individual spaces, but we follow reluctantly. Let us confess our sins and commit ourselves to follow the path God has chosen for us. Join me in the prayer of confession. God of compassion, the way to the cross is as much a mystery to us as it was to the immediate followers of Jesus. But we have heard how your grace is exercised in the journey of suffering and rejection experienced by Jesus. Help us to hear with ears inspired, to see with eyes opened to your ways, and to respond with lives committed to your service. God of our Lenten journey, watch and walk with Jesus. Oh, we repent, O oh God. We cannot name our own cross, even though we try. You must show us the cross you give us. Help us see. Give us the faith to respond and follow Jesus. We have heard that it is in losing our life for the sake of the gospel of Jesus that we find our life. God of our Lenten journey, we watch. The one who calls us to this place calls us to reconciliation through grace. God will not deny a repentant heart or an open spirit. Know that you are forgiven and walk in the new way that is made known to you in God's love. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Good morning. Today's reading is from Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. As God's messenger, I give each of you this morning, be honest in your estimate of yourselves, measuring your value by how much faith God has put in you. Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has special functions, so it is with Christ's body. We are all parts of his one body, and each of us has different work to do. And since we are all one body in Christ, we belong to each other, and each of us needs all the others. God has given each of us the ability to do certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophecy, speak out when you have faith that God is speaking to you. If your gift is that of serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, do a good job at teaching. If your gift is to encourage others, do it. If you have money, share it generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The next scripture is from Mark 8, verses 31 to 38. Jesus predicts his death. Then Jesus began to tell them that he, the Son of Man, would suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the leaders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, and three days later, he would rise again. As he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter took him aside and told him he shouldn't say things like that. Jesus turned and looked at his disciples and then said to Peter very sternly, Get away from me, Satan. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view and not from God's. Then he called his disciples and the crowds to come over and listen. If any of you wants to be my follower, he told them, you must put aside your selfish ambition, shoulder your cross, and follow me. If you try to keep your life for yourself, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will find true life. And how do you benefit if you gain the whole world? or lose your own soul in the process? Is anything worth more than your soul? If a person is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, I, the Son of Man, will be ashamed of that person when I return in glory of my Father with the holy angels. The word of the Lord.
See, I'm making sure it's my turn this week. <laughs> I thought so, but, you know, lesson learned. So today we continue our uh, series on spiritual disciplines. I'll just say again where this is coming from. This is a book by Richard Foster. Um, you should make this a part of your spiritual library. Uh, it's, it's just a wonderful read of these spiritual disciplines. So things that I say that are pretty profound, there's a good chance it's a quote from here. I'll, I'll quote, I'll cite my sources. Um, so if you want more of that, get the book. So we continue this, and as I start, I want to make an important purpose statement that he also makes about the disciplines themselves, the purpose of them. He says that the purpose of the disciplines is freedom. Okay, I want to, because I'm going to focus on that today. The aim is freedom. The aim is not just discipline. And what he means by that is don't as you take on any of these, get caught up in the discipline. The discipline is not the end. The discipline is the avenue to a closer walk with Jesus. So if you're in any of these disciplines and you're so hyper-focused on it, you think this is the whole purpose, it's not. The disciplines together, lived out, lead to closer walk, freedom. Keep this in mind, that word freedom especially as we talk about the two disciplines today, submission and service. Really quick, a follow-up of the four inward disciplines. Now, they're not listed in your bulletin this week, um, so I'll list them for you. The four inward disciplines, we started inward. Meditation, prayer, study, and fasting. Those were the four inward disciplines. Disciplines, the discipline of stillness and meditation, the discipline of considering what sustains us truly through fasting, the discipline of living the perceptive life through our study. Remember, it would be the books or even of life itself. And the discipline of seeking and finding the never-ending communion with God, and that is done through prayer. Those disciples we call inward. They happen right kind of in, in here. Well, now we move on to what he calls the outward disciplines. And these are submission, service, simplicity, and solitude. Today we'll talk about submission and service. Now he calls these outward because when you take on these disciplines, they have a direct effect on those that you encounter on your community, as we'll see. Therefore, they are outward. They're things that you do, but they have an outward effect. So let's begin with submission, but they're tied together because submission leads to a life of service. Now, I'm just going to say, maybe you're already thinking it. I don't know, but I thought it. The word itself, submission, is very hard for us. I think submission is hard because it's loaded, and I think it's hard in our culture, in our context. In everyday language, we don't want to use the word submission when we're talking about really our relationship with anyone or any institution or anything. Submission sounds an awful lot like giving up your freedom, doesn't it? That's what it sounds like when you talk about submitting to something. But that's the paradoxical thing about faith. Because it's through the, uh, the discipline of submission that Foster would say that we are actually gaining our freedom through submission. How so? Well, it is through our faithful discipline and submission to the way of Christ, which is taught throughout the Gospels, that we are actually gaining freedom. And here's how we're doing it. We are gaining the freedom because we, through submission, are laying down this burden that we carry with us of always looking out for ourselves and always needing to have things go our way. And I think if we're all honest, this is a burden in a lot of our lives through the actions that we do. We're always looking out for ourselves, aren't we? 
Through submission, we are laying down our ego. We are laying down our self-centeredness. We are laying them down at the foot of the cross. The biblical teaching of submission focuses, pri focuses primarily on the spirit with which we view people. This is why it's outward. And as I'll say again, if we're honest, I think many of us are servants or slaves to the wrong tyranny, the tyranny of just getting things our way. But it's through submission through giving that up, that we gain our freedom. Foster writes, in submission, we are at last free to value other people, truly value other people. Their dreams and their plans become important to us. Again, because we're not so focused on ourselves. We enter into a new, wonderful, glorious freedom. The freedom to give up our own rights for the good of others. For the first time through submission, we can love one another unconditionally. We have given up the right to demand that they return that love to us. That's not how it works. No longer do we feel that we have to be treated in a certain way. We rejoice in the successes of others. We feel genuine sorrow in the failures of others. And it is of little consequence that our plans are frustrated if their plans succeed. We discover that it is far better to serve our neighbor than to have things our own way. Doesn't this sound really countercultural? It does to me. So therefore, this is a momentous challenge for us, I think. Momentous challenge for many of us. This will take a great shift in mind and heart and life really live into. But you got to understand, and we know this at its heart, it is Jesus who taught this life to live. This is not only submission as defined by Jesus, but it is the way of life laid out by Jesus, if we are following his example. This is the way of what we call the cross life. You see, Jesus lived and Jesus taught the cross life. He lived it out through example in his day. He shattered the customs of his day. He did this by corresponding with, and not just that, by, by taking seriously women. This wasn't done. Jesus did it. He did that by meeting with children. That wasn't done. Jesus did it. He lived the cross life when he took a towel on that, what we call Monday Thursday, when he took a towel and he washed the feet of his disciples when there was a standstill because nobody else was going to do it. He served them through submission. This Jesus who easily could have called down legions of angels Angel armies, even, right? Could have called them down at any time. Instead, chose the cross death of Calvary. Jesus' life was the cross life of submission and service. Jesus' death was the cross death of conquest through suffering. And he was so bold as to preach and teach what we heard today from the Gospel of Mark. That if any should follow him, right? We're signing up for following Jesus. We would like to do that. If any should follow him, they are to take up their own cross life and live it out. Well, how do we do such an act? We want to know. We want to do it. It is through submission. It is through giving up of ourselves. Foster has seven acts of submission. So I'm going to name them, and then you can digest them. 
The first is submission to God, when we submit our mind, our body, and our heart to the hands of God. That's first. The second is our submission to Scripture, when we yield ourselves to stop and hear the Word, to receive the Word, obey the Word. We are called to submission to family. We commit to truly listening and sharing in the interests of our family. Our submission to neighbors and those who we meet throughout our day. We submit by performing small acts as a regular part of our life of neighborliness, of servanthood. It is submission to the believing community. This is what Paul was getting at in Romans. To know your gifts and give and serve the church selflessly, not looking to see what you get in return. It is submission to the broken and the despised of this world. You must seek out and then identify genuinely with the downtrodden, with the rejected. And then it's submission to the world because we cannot live in isolation. We do not live in isolation. We take responsibility, therefore, for our actions and how they affect people on any scale in the world. The discipline of submission leads them. It's part of the discipline of service. You see how these go hand in hand. Because when we submit and you give all that up, we joyfully serve. Jesus taught that whoever was among them to be greatest must be the servant. True service is true leadership. True service does not need the limelight. True service is free from these calculations that we make of reciprocity, right? Of, well, if I help you at this point, when are you going to come back and help me in the future? True service is free from that. You serve freely. True service ministers simply and faithfully. True service is a lifestyle. True service then builds community up. And right, the New Testament is filled with examples through Paul's letters of models of service. We read one today of models of service. This is because Paul knew how you build a church. How do you build a church? You build a church by getting your ego out of the way and then by knowing your role and your gift and by everybody serving together and doing it together. That's how you build a church. How do we serve? Paul would say you begin by knowing and embracing your gift because God has given you a gift. Then you find ways to utilize your gift. Not somebody else's gifts, not something that's not your gift. Utilize and serve with your gift. And he then lists multiple places, including here in Romans, of these gifts that God gives us. You can look, at, you can look in your bulletin for the, look at the list of the gifts that he lists in Romans 12. This service is necessary for the health of the church. We know this. And we can think back, well, we can look right now in the church of when things are really fun and joyful. That's tied to service, isn't it? And you can think back to times in your life in the church. It's all tied to service. More than any other single way, the grace of humility is worked into our lives through this discipline. Because nothing grows your humility like service does. And again, we go back to freedom. True humility grants you freedom. I think we all have examples in our lives, in our community, of what mutual service is and can be, right? We know it when we see it, and we enjoy it, and we love it. There's nothing like the harmony that comes from people using their individual gifts for one another. There's nothing like that. Jesus showed us that way. He showed it physically throughout his ministry. He showed it with 
a towel wiping feet. He showed it all the way to the cross. I'll leave you with one last quote from Foster. The risen Christ beckons us to the ministry of the towel. Such a ministry, flowing out of the inner recesses of the heart, is life and joy and peace. He says, perhaps you would like to begin by experimenting with a prayer that he uses. This prayer is a good one to commit to your memory. And that is the, to begin the day by praying this. Lord Jesus, as it would please you, bring me someone today who I may serve. Lord Jesus, as it would please you, bring me someone today who I may serve. Your submission, your service, freedom will be yours. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Let us pray to God. Gracious, loving, and merciful God of renewal and of springtime and of the coming back of things, we praise you and worship you this morning as we gather for worship. We give you thanks that you are the creator of all those things that are seen and unseen. You are the great sustainer of it. God, you made creation and all that is in it with your words and you sprung it into life. And we are just so humbled to now be a part of that. God, throughout the journey of faith of our ancestors, there were times where things were really harmonious, and there were other times when it seems like everything just fell apart. Throughout it all, the harmony and the discord, you were there, God. So you pulled us back in through your grace and your mercy, through the words of the prophets, through the words that we needed to hear in the moment. You did that as we journeyed through. And then finally, it was in the perfect moment of time that you sent Jesus Christ to be and live and dwell among us, to teach and to heal and to live the cross life. This radical way of living still guides us. So God, as we consider our walk, our discipleship, May we consider Jesus' life of submission and service. And may we be given just, just an ounce of that, that we can go live out and be the same. God, as we come to the table, we come with all that is on our hearts, the prayers that we have in, in our hearts and our minds, and we believe that we are united here, that we are risen up, and we can lift those to you who are eager to listen. So God, from our hearts to your ears, hear our prayers this morning. God, we praise you for the spirit, that which equips the church, empowers the church, and that which makes this Meal special, simple elements that point to a great, great thing. So God, may your spirit be very present among us, and may it make these elements for us be just as the body of Christ is, just as the cup of salvation is, and may that transform us from the inside out. God, we unite all of our prayers together simply, humbly, the way Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. When we gather for worship, we retell the story of when Jesus gathered with his disciples. It was that Passover meal, and after they got together at a table, he took the bread that was in front of him, and he asked God's blessing on it, and he broke it. And he said to him, Take and eat, this is my body. It's broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so just as they did, we take the body and we take it, the bread of life, in remembrance of Jesus. After they had eaten together, he took a glass of wine and he poured 
it and he said, this, this cup, this is a sign of the new covenant and it is shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. And he said, drink from it, all of you. When you do this, whenever you do it, do so in remembrance of me. So we do that. Brothers and sisters, this the cup of salvation. Let us pray. God, take us from this place and space and lead us out. Lead us to follow the cross life as we get nearer and nearer to the end of Lent, the Holy Week. Take us into our community and help us be agents of transformation. Let that start here now. Through Christ's name I pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go. Go with the grace of our Lord Jesus. Go with the love of God. Go with the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Now, forevermore, you be at peace on your journey. Amen.